Welcome to our merchandising panel. I'm Rachel Del Grande, Director of Customer Success here at Elastic Path, and I'm a former merchandiser. We are joined by leaders from Pokemon and Mavi. Uh, Chelsea, please introduce yourself to the audience and give us a bit of context on Mavi. Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea Lawless. I'm the head of product brand partnerships and e-commerce at Mavi. Ultimately, Mavi is a hyper curated wellness marketplace that includes the very best of wellness and service products on the planet uh, to be discovered. And our mission is to connect to the world to wellness by making the wellness market more accessible and exciting and easy to navigate for our consumers. Awesome. Well, we're really happy to have you here, Chelsea. And Steve, on to you. Uh, yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Yin. Uh, I've been with uh, Pokemon uh, for uh, the past seven years, uh, doing a number of things in e-commerce. And actually, I've been in e-commerce most of my career. Um, uh, as, a, as a disclaimer, uh, opinions today that I express are my own and uh, mainly from a few of my coworkers, but definitely not the opinions of the Pokemon Company International. So uh, uh, don't tweet afterwards about how Pokemon said there's a Pokemon said that because Pokemon didn't say anything today. Uh, but yeah, for those of you who don't know what Pokemon is, um, you might, you know, we do things like this, training cards, and uh, we do stuff like this. Uh, and, and what we try to do is bring smiles and happiness to uh, Pokemon fans um, all over all over the world. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that's kind of what we do. So. It's hard to imagine that no one knows what Pokemon <laughs> is. Uh, what Pikachu? It, yes, especially I was just telling uh, Steve before we got started. My five year old is uh, excited to have Pikachu as his birthday uh, sort of mascot. So we love Pokemon in our household. Um, so we will get this conversation rolling. I have a few questions planned to kick us off. Uh, and if you have a question you would like us to discuss, please submit it into the chat. Um, so let's start with you, Steve. What yeah. do you see as the next digital merchandising trend? Oh, um, uh, I don't know what it's the next, but uh, I think one of the big things uh, uh, we're seeing here is kind of the the converging of uh, uh, social with e-commerce. And so, um, you know, before it's been like you sell stuff on, on your e-commerce and then site and then your social is where you kind of do your social thing. But now we're seeing a, a very much of a blend where, you know, uh, uh, you're, you're selling stuff now on, on Instagram and, and now you're putting more uh, 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 social content and customer uh, uh, customer reviews and their images and of, of, of what they've posted on social on your e-commerce site. So that there's now a blend where, where we're trying to get people from uh, social to e-commerce in a very seamless, um, uh, uh, it, it's more of a seamless uh, manner where, the experiences and how you merchandise your product on, on social is very similar to how you do it on your e-commerce site and, and, and vice versa. So I think that that's very much of a, of a trend to, to blend to blend those two worlds together. So. Totally. I mean, I think it's seeing the authenticity that comes with someone posting your product and giving it rave reviews and how do you bring that content onto your site because it, it's gold, but also, you know, it brings faster cycles to how you might need to show or, or bring that your products up and, and merchandise them in a new way. It definitely, I think, brings the faster cycle times than maybe merchandising was 10 years ago uh, when I was merchandising, date myself there. Um, so Chelsea, on to you. How do you, what do you think is the next biggest trend in, in merchandising? Yeah, I think with trends just being more accessible now than ever to, you know, Steve's point, we're going to still see like continued leverage on both content marketing and all social commerce. So on all social platforms, and we're going to also see these social plat platforms most likely elevate as well to try to keep up with that demand. Um, live stream and social commerce are going to be going mainstream here in the States. They have been huge, huge in China for years now. And especially post pandemic, we see that uh, trend here coming to the States and really one-on-one -on -one personalization marketing. So 
um, thinking about AI, machine learning technologies, uh, things that can help you acquire and evaluate not only your first party data, but that zero party data that is crucial now for companies to gather. Um, and then overall, you know, seeing um, headless and API commerce that allows for constant innovation, right? For brands to constantly be able to keep up with these trends um, and really that voice search and AR as well. Totally. That makes a lot of sense. And what would you say, what's the one piece of advice you would give to, to fellow digital merchandisers? Ooh, I mean, I would, I think for me, ultimately it's do not overlook your filter or search function technologies. I think those are crucial for your e-commerce site. I mean, on average, 30% of visitors use search and you could be missing a lot of opportunities there if um, you aren't using those right. Um, and then really uh, thinking about collecting and how to lab leverage all that custom customer data as well too, that I kind of spoke to above. Um, and that really can help you advance um, as both a digital merchandiser um, and as an e-commerce company as a whole. Yeah, I, I would say throughout my years in e-commerce, I always say you have to start with a very good foundation so you can use that customer data, data to its fullest. And the customer data can be leveraged in omni-channel. It can be leveraged for personalization. And if you don't have a good solid base and then you know, technologies like headless commerce, technologies like um, the personalization, like a good search, like a good CMS. If you do not have those pieces to be able to quickly pivot, um, it, it's hard. Like you have to have all those, those pieces in your back pocket to fully leverage and um, meet your customer where they need to be met. So totally agree. And yeah. so oh, Steve, on to you. Yeah, oh, I was no, going to say, I, Steve, I, on to you. I was going to, uh, 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 you know, a follow up and say, yeah, there's just so much data everywhere. Like everything is like AI this and, and you know, uh, 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 yeah, uh, you, we can we can uh, uh, zero party data, first party data. And and, and um, a lot of people are trying to figure out like really how to best use that data. Um, uh, you know, a lot of companies say, you know, well, we can help you personalize, but um, because we can gather all this data, but do you really know how to personalize and, 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 and how do you know that your uh, recommendations and, 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 you know, what you can do with that data is better than, than somebody else. And, and as, as a, you know, uh, merchandiser, uh, how do you, how do you make, you know, a determination on who can best use the data? Um, I, I don't have any of those answers, but uh, those are some of the things that, uh, uh, you know, question that, you know, we, we have to grapple with. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's tough. It's, and you have to you know, figure out how to use all that data in a, in a, without bias. Right. And so, um, there are times when, um, or the, you know, there are times when you make a decision and then you use data to back up your decision, but then, but then you've already made that decision that that's, you know, you're, you're full of bias there. Right. How, how do okay. you come with an open mind without knowing where you're going to go? use that data to steer you with in, into one direction or another, right? And then there, there you can have a more open kind of honest discussion about how to use the data as opposed to using the data to, to debate your, your you know, point of view, which is not very useful from a, you know, a, a business uh, uh, point of view. Then, then you're just, you know, uh, fighting on, on something that you've already made the decision on. Anyways, it, it's, no. it's a tough one. No, it totally makes sense. And I think if you think of traditional merchandising, you you made a buy and you backed it up with data and then you had to defend that buy for the next you know, six months. Uh, and so now that world is changing where you need to have data lead you yeah. in what products you purchase and how you merchandise them and what channel you put them in, whether it's store or e-com or what region you put them in. And so I think the world of merchandising is, is changing and you just give the you know, you have to have your, give your team the, the right tools to be able to do that. So totally, it's, it, it, you're, it's totally the same things I think about all the time and the problems we, we always try to solve for our customers. I totally agree. So I, I, if, I, I wonder then, Steve, like what's the one piece of advice you would give to fellow digital merchandisers then? Um, is it, is I, it data? I think, what do you think? I think related to, to, to what we're talking about is, is um, uh, everyone wants to, you know, personalize the experience and, and, and thus then the site becomes personalized. So, 
So I would say, you know, if, if you're a merchandiser for, 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 for a site or you're running a site, just, you know, UBU, you, uh, figure out uh, what's, um, what's unique about your site and, and personalize that experience for your fans. And um, there are certain things that you can look at for, uh, look at from other sites to kind of make sure that you're following industry trends. But, um, you know, you don't want to be a site that necessarily uh, is, is a replica of, of another site. Um, Offer something unique, um, and yeah, yeah, for your fans. Personalize your 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 site, um, and, and the whole the whole experience uh, for 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 your unique fans. So, right, you want them to come back and shop again, right? Defeat the one and done problem. Yeah, it, it's it's um, uh, in, in merchandising or, or just running running a site that there's that balance of of um, you want your products and your experience to be the hero, right? You don't want a your fan base to learn how to use the site or learn how to shop, right? That's why we have, uh, uh, you know, an add to cart button says add to cart. It doesn't say place something in your basket for the promise of make you know bring it into your home. I mean, you, you want to have certain things that are uh, super industry standard so that customers don't have to think about it. Uh, but then you also want to personalize your site so that you give your 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 fans a, a unique experience. So there's that balance. I don't know where you know where the the right place to 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 to, to be in is, uh, but but it's something that you know we think about is, you know, whenever we need to do something, to what extent do we follow industry trends? Most most of the time, there's no industry trends. Um, and at what time do we try to do something completely unique and and. Um, that's that's a question that we we ask ourselves uh, all the time in in, in uh, building a site or, or merchandising. So. Yeah, makes sense. So so Chelsea, what's a merchandising challenge you've experienced, and how have you overcome it? Um, I think beyond just that personalization piece that uh, Steve spoke to, I would say continuously just defining and then re refining also what's your differentiate differentiation in the e-commerce space right because the e-commerce space is so saturated especially coming out post pandemic more than ever every company any company should be in the e-commerce space so how do you uh, really control that journey um that shopping journey and bringing not only that personalization aspect but bringing something different to the table um, I think how we've really overcome that at Mavi is, you know, just really looking at a way to converge content, community, and commerce. So really keeping our consumers engaged and really bringing a personalized wellness journey that ultimately we are with them for life for. Um, so I think a lot of that is going to be leveraging that data. Um, and a lot of that is also going to be really sticking to our brand ethos and working closely with our marketing team, as well as our whole merchandising team to make sure that that journey really comes across as a highly curated, but um, also highly engaged and personalized space. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I feel like when I think about Pokemon, I also think about community. Um, yeah. I think you're, I think of brand, I think of community. I think you all do, Steve, a great job of fostering that. Um, and I think that's such an important thing today as a brand to foster, uh, you know, community around yourself, a, a stance of what you are, as Chelsea said, and, and making sure that's known through your content, your marketing, how, how you merchandise yourself on a PDP. Um, it, and it's interesting um, how merchandisers are now sort of tasked of, of doing that instead of just, you know, here's, here's your, here's your image. And then here's your basic information about your product that you're selling. It's, it's more than that these days. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so being, being very closely in sync with between the, the, the people who, who uh, run the site versus people who run marketing, uh, making sure that uh, everyone tells the same kind of story and, and the images and, and, and the photographs, um, uh, on your PDPs um, uh, are, um, you know, telling the same story as, as what, you know, your, your, uh, what you show on, on social, right? And so um, uh, one of those things is, is uh, uh, Pokemon is a very, you know, inclusive uh, brand. Um, and so, uh, you know, we try to, you know, as, uh, you know, for our PDPs show a, 
a, a wide variety of people and, and, and uh, bring that kind of uh, in inclusive uh, 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 theme to how we merchandise. And so, yeah, it's, it's uh, you're not just a merchandiser, you're a merchandiser slash marketer, so. Yeah, it's very yeah, true. I, to Steve's point, like having a very cohesive experience top to bottom is very, very important for any brand, um, as well as, you know, just trying to really differentiate yourself in that e-commerce space. Makes a lot of sense. So Steve, what would you say is a merchandising challenge that Pokemon's experienced and how have you overcome it? Oh, um, well, I would say uh, all of our challenges, I don't think we've really overcome yet. Um, uh, I would say, uh, yeah, um, uh, how, do, how do we navigate with uh, all the global regulations, right? And so um, there's, there's like GDPR and their privacy, personalization, and um, all that changes how uh, uh, merchandising is, uh, is, is done. Um, uh, uh, and because of this regulation, do we, do we focus only on, when we personalize, only on interest session uh, or, or within the session uh, uh, personalization, right? So for example, um, if you search for uh, Charizard, uh, uh, you know, when you come to the site, does, does the, does the rest of your site, uh, do we float up um, on recommended items, a bunch of Charizard or, or Charmander or Charizard related um, stuff. And, and for those of you who don't know Pokemon, uh, Charizard is, uh, and, and Charmander, uh, Charizard is a evolution of um, uh, Charmander. So, uh, so, so yeah, H how do we do that? And, and um, do we go with the lowest common denominator where, where we take the, the strictest, um, uh, region and take those rules and apply to uh, all countries because we, we operate in US, Canada, and UK. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, how, how, do we, how do we do with uh, cookies and, and, and do, we, do we, you know, just follow the rules with, uh, from, the, from the country that has the strictest laws? And so I don't think we really um, uh, have an answer to that, especially since uh, things are changing. Um, uh, yeah, and, and there's some things that some changes and some legal changes that don't come fast enough. Um, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, I don't know if we're going to go into payments, but uh, uh, one of the things that we, we are seeing that I personally really like is is uh, the uh, in Europe they recently have the um, uh, uh, multi-factor authentication. What that means is for, for those of you in the U.S., uh, if you if you make a payment with your credit card and it's card not present, um, uh, they, they, you know, you have to uh, enter in a, a number that they either email you or text you. Um, and that has um, uh, significantly, at least for our site, uh, re reduced the fraud, right? Uh, because you can't just steal a number, you actually need the email address and the, and the phone associated with that credit card. Um, so uh, we really like it from a merchandising, from a business perspective, uh, but uh, it's one of those things that um, uh, uh, it's stricter in the, you, you know, in, in Europe, but um, we would love it if it came to the U.S. much faster and everyone had to do that. Uh, we'd all save a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I don't have an answer, but it, it is a, legal is a challenge that we um, deal with all the time with merchandising and all that as a business. So. Yeah, especially if you have one global team that merchandises for all different regions, it gets, I feel like, very complicated to keep up with all the laws. Um, and it's, it's hard, right? And it's also important to build a tech stack that can deal with all the different regions. Um, and that's not a simple, that's not simple either. And wasn't something that was easily done, I feel like, a few years ago either. I think it's getting easier, but not perfect e either. So I, I don't know if there's a perfect answer for it, but I, I totally agree um, that it's, it's quite difficult. So um, on to our next question. Uh, I'll start with you, Steve. How does the current supply chain problems impact your merchandising? Oh, um, uh, well, first of all, uh, supply chain, you know, I'm sure everyone is aware is, is, is yeah, definitely impacting us. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if, if people are going on the a, a, a feast and famine kind of thing with, with inventory, right? And if, if you're not sure when you, you when you're going to get your stuff, um, 
do you buy more of it? So uh, it's kind of like the uh, the uh, the toilet paper problem is is uh, you, you think toilet paper is running out, so you hoard a bunch of toilet paper. But now, where are you going to put it? You can't put it in your bathroom. So now you got to find place to store it. So now you're putting it in your garage, and and so now you know your your cash flow. Toilet paper doesn't cost that much money, but uh, as an analogy, now you're spending a ton of money, you know, spending it on toilet paper, and now only that you're paying to store it somewhere, um, and you can't do anything with toilet paper until you know you eat more food. Um, uh, yeah, you're just it's just you're you're running into because you have. Uh, uh, no inventory, you have to buy a bunch. And now you're getting a bunch of people who are, uh, uh, who aren't used to forecasting demand. Now you right. have to forecast out uh, many, many uh, months, if not over a year or two years. And, and now uh, with forecasting, now there's inventory risk, right? And so um, now you're taking up uh, uh, manufacturing capacity that you might not really need. So now manufacturing capacity is not uh, efficiently applied to where demand is needed, which compounds the whole supply chain problem, uh, mm -hmm. because now demand uh, capacity can't be used for things that people really want. Um, uh, and then next thing you know, you've got boats sitting outside of Long Beach, and they're just waiting to get stuff off. I don't know. It's just um, timelines are lengthened. Um, it, yeah, everything is 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 all all, all messed up. So I'm. Uh, uh, hoping to get back to a, a more uh, normal uh, uh, world um, uh, soon. But I'm not telling anyone anything that they don't already know that I haven't experienced on a, on a daily basis. But it, it, yeah. the, the feast and famine is, 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 a, is a big problem. Totally. And I feel like for, for you all, Chelsea, it's it's a bit complicated because you have partners plus, you know, it's it's a, a good mix of both digital and physical products. So can you can you elaborate more for us? Yeah, absolutely. Especially on the physical uh, product side, we've of course seen the effect of this just in our own internal assortment, you know, trying to secure the inventory levels and numbers that we need. We are a dropship model ultimately at Mavi. But um, with that being said, you know, we're working with thousands of different brand partners and really trying to negotiate with them, get them to secure that inventory for us, um, holding those inventory levels for us. So that way our assortments don't get affected or as affected as possible. But I think mostly what we're seeing on our side of the business is just that shift in negotiations. Ultimately for Mavi, we are such a unique platform and solution. So we have been able to really offer that value to a lot of our brand partners, but um, definitely having those tougher conversations where there's certain products that we've been wanting to do, but we just can't make it work right now based off of available inventory that they have. And then really looking at ultimately, okay, when can we get that inventory in? And when can we add that to the assortment? Um, and at what point do we need more of this or that or, you know, really change and rework that assortment. So for us, it's constantly reworking the assortment we have and making sure that we're offering enough um, and across the whole broader wellness space, but also keeping it very curated and tight and true to those brands too. Yeah, that seems like flexibility is just key, right? Um, yeah. Because you never really know what, what you're going to get and, and being a good partner and all those sorts of things. It's just flexibility is key. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, moving launch dates and moving marketing and calendars and email uh, email schedules and and it's just it, yeah, it's not easy, especially if you know uh, Pokemon is a brand. We have you know uh, e-commerce, but then we also have lots of other things going on with the company, right? And and making sure that the news and marketing goes out so that you don't have uh, multiple things colliding on the same day. Um, that's tough because if you miss a day, it might be another, you know, week or two before you have another slot to, to, to get your marketing in because you're, you're, you're kind of um, uh, uh, competing for, for, for uh, the, the, the same marketing as, say, animation or Pokemon Go or, you know, other things that the company has. So it's not easy. Yeah, that makes sense. That seems like that, that's, that's a tough, you know, navigation to, to make. Yeah. So subscriptions is a bit of to a hot topic in the market. So Chelsea, how do you see subscriptions uh, impacting merchandising? 
Um, you know, ultimately, I think the the great thing about subscriptions is really you're just guaranteeing yourself, you know, that repeat customer. So really making sure from a merchandising standpoint that you can really plan for that, that subscription base that you have and really lean into that data and also what's working for that subscription base and what isn't. Um, so that definitely helps as well. But I think overall, I just see it as more of an opportunity for a lot of these companies to secure more lifelong uh, customers, right? And secure them coming back on a constant basis. So really just leaning into that data aspect there. Totally. I mean, for, for me, I like the convenience for subscriptions myself when it comes to some things. Um, and oftentimes I forget to cancel them. So I think that's a big win for a lot of the, the retailers I subscribe with. And yeah. for, Steve, for Steve, I know this is something that's been on the roadmap for you all. So um, can you elaborate on subscriptions and how you think it uh, impacts merchandising? Well, um, uh, right now uh, we don't offer subscriptions on the site. Um, uh, you know, we offer uh, Pokemon cards. Um, you know, I've showed you, you know, well, this and then Pokemon cards. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and we, we have new Pokemon cards uh, coming out all the time. And so um, uh, we have expansions, uh, you know, like four or five times a year where we have a new set uh, of, of cards that come out. And so that kind of product cycle lends itself to a subscription model. Um, uh, uh, one of the things, you know, uh, uh, we need a think it through um, and, and I'll have answers on the, this yet, but how, how do we make it easier uh, for people to, to um, sign up and manage the uh, subscriptions? And, and, and um, how do we, uh, uh, you know, as, as Rachel mentioned, like, you know, she forgot to cancel, right? Um, is that an experience that we want our customers to have to think through? And, and is, is thinking about canceling part of the experience? Do we want that? I personally probably don't want that as part of the experience, but, but the, the, there's a lot of challenges on how to make it right, right? How do we even out consumption so that we, we uh, send stuff to them, uh, to a customer at the same time that they want it in the right level so they don't have um, piles of dog food that just, you know, uh, grows and grows in a garage and, 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 and that makes them not happy. And do we want that? So I don't, we don't really have the answer, um, but um, uh, uh, just, we have a lot more questions than answers. But, questions and then answers but it is something that if there is a way where we can help customers uh, uh consume uh our, our goods on a regular basis without having to uh, spend too much time in in buying stuff I, I think that would be great especially since um uh, sometimes we have some stuff that are really hot and, and um customers don't want to have to you know in a sense stand in line to buy the stuff all the time they just would rather get in the on their doorstep so yeah so no answers but it, it is something that's uh, of interest uh that we've we've thought about but yeah yeah that nothing no, no comment more than the fact that uh, we have expansions on a regular basis so well, yeah, and I do. That point, Rachel, too, is ultimately in the subscription space, you know, how you can really retain those those subscri subscribing members would be offering that value. Right. So when you're thinking about being in the subscription space, it's more than just the convenience. You really have to make sure you're offering that value. And with that being said, you're constantly looking at how you can reevaluate that as a merchandiser, too, because you want to bring the utmost value to your subscription. Otherwise, your retention rates will hurt. Right. So value as well as convenience are both big key players in that subscription piece. Totally. And I think it, it ties really together really well with loyalty um, because you're rewarding them for staying with you. Um, and so I think it makes a nice picture, uh, especially for what you were talking about, Steve. And I, I think what you're saying, Chelsea, it, 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 it gives the customer a great reason to come back, but also gives you great forecasting um, and helps with a lot of the things you're talking about with supply chain and all that and all that. So it, it definitely is, is a great tool for merchandisers. Um, so actually we have a question from the audience. I'll go ahead and switch to that. It's actually for you, Chelsea. Marketplaces come with their own challenges. What advice do you have for merchandisers who want to showcase their brand, but also have the brand requirements of brands within the marketplace? Also have the brand requirements of the brands within the marketplace? Yeah, so how do you deal with the brand requirements and, and all that kind of stuff? 
I would say, so I think it's key working with whoever your brand partner manager is. So whoever your contact is through that marketplace, you need to be working with to constantly making sure that you're being able to be a part of that staging pr process, right? Seeing how they're, how they're staging your process, uh, how they're staging your product, as well as how they have it merchandised, giving them feedback on it, right? Ultimately, you want to sell your product just as bad as they do. So if they aren't, you know, having the best product description, if they're using a lifestyle image that maybe should be swapped out for a hero image, things like that, really just being active and being active in that process with that team will really help you sell that product. Because even though they might have restrictions within their marketplace, I think ultimately the goal of that marketplace is they want to sell your product too. So you just need to find a way and a balance to work with them to best be able to sell that product or, you know, your plethora of products that you have on that platform. Yeah, I would say I was actually, when I was a buyer, I was a buyer that sold third party on a lot of different places, Amazon being a majority of one. And, and so it was great when we had great images from the companies, we worked with a lot of big companies and we were able to showcase the, the shoes, I was mainly a shoe buyer in the way that the brand wanted. But if we didn't get the right images, we would shoot them ourselves, we would merchandise them in the way that we felt was good. But the more data that we had, the more clear, clean it was coming, it was coming directly from a PIM that helped us. So all the having all the data, having the lookbooks, having the information that was that was a big, big help for us um, in the way that in helping us position the information the way that the brand wanted us to. So it was a huge help. Yeah, ultimately, I think if you have the ability and you you do in a marketplace model, right, because it's so dependent on what's coming directly from the vendor. So really take that into your own hands. Look at if you could do better product images, better descriptions, things like that, um, and really try to push for those things with uh, whoever your contact is. All right. So question for Steve, during the height of the pandemic, Pokemon cards were difficult to find, which drove prices and prices higher. Um, and we all know with the, um, there's the big, you know, collectibles boom, there's, I think it's still going on. Um, so as supply chain rose to meet demand, did an interest uh, take hit? Uh, so product selling out versus meeting demand is an interesting act. Yeah, so, so um, uh, what is the question there? So if is did a supply rose to meet demand, did interest take a hit? Um, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't comment on, on uh, you know, supply. Uh, uh, but you know what, in, in, in general, um, you know, we've got a lot of fans out there. Uh, we want to make sure that we make fans happy. And, and so um, uh, we want to make lots of fans happy. And so uh, if, if there are kids out there who have birthday parties and, and they don't have, they don't have Pokemon cards that, that will make me sad. And so um, uh, uh, because we can't make, you know, the, a lot of these, these kids happy. And so, um, uh, you know, what, one thing we try to do is, is try to be, you know, try to spread the, uh, the, 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 the 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 happiness of, of Pokemon to to as many people as possible. So um, we try we try to get the products in the fans of in, in the hands of fans ideally, as opposed to um, uh, uh, people who would you know uh, 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 flippers, uh, people who would uh, there's some unsavory uh, activities that we we you know prefer not to have have happen, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, uh, we try we try to try to meet that goal of, of making sure that if somebody wants Pokemon cards, um, um, you know, they you know they have an avenue of getting it. Now, again, I just have to say everything I'm saying is my own opinion. <laughs> None of this is Pokemon's opinion. So, uh, another disclaimer out there. So, yes. Yeah. No. No tweeting at Steve, please. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> Um, follow up question for Steve. How do you prepare for big launches to ensure that the site doesn't crash? Um, I, I think part, part of it is in merchandise, making sure everyone's uh, in sync. So it's mm -hmm. a lot of communication. And as the team grows, uh, uh, you know, 
Uh, <laughs> we use we use email, we have Slack, we have Zoom, so we use a lot of technology to make sure that everyone is in in, in sync. And um, uh, it's a lot of just uh, you know project management, um, um, and and um, yeah, it, it's it's I, I think it's. The, the key is is making sure everyone's in sync and it's a little easier nowadays because um, uh, uh, we're not limited by the physical constraints of a conference room right and so right. Uh, a small room that can fit six well you know well now you can have a lot more than six people in a, a, a you know on the zoom meeting so um, I, I think uh, 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 that is very important and then letting people know that um, uh, uh, to expect a spike on a big launch so that people don't, people who are looking at things uh, when they will expect a spike in the right places and not think something is wrong. Um, and also preparing our technology and maybe, uh, you know, this is a, a, then a plug for Elastic Path <laughs> to say uh, how, um, you know, you got to make sure that your technology scales up um, uh, as you need it so you can have uh, things on demand and sort of technology and scalability on demand. And so, uh, again, this is something that Rachel can speak a lot better to than, than I can. But yeah. No, it's it's definitely a partnership working all together to make sure everyone's aligned to help make things go smoothly. And I'm sure, Chelsea, for you, it's, you you know, planning for lots of your launches and, and partnerships and probably very similar with your brand partners, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. And ultimately too, you know, we're going to the market in the employer space first. So, you know, heavily focused on how we offer that app experience for not only our brand partners and the consumer, but really a focus on how can we elevate these brands and create and architect enough choice across the wellness space, but keep it tight and curated and make sure that these brands get the exposure that they need as well. Definitely, definitely. So I see another um, question here in the chat. So how do um, the brands approach customer service and what challenges do they foresee as we approach Q3 and Q4 this year? So it uh, could be coverage, shipping issues, supply chain. How are you guys preparing for this in, customers, in terms of customer service? Chelsea, I'll go to you first. Yes. Yeah, so ultimately all customer service, um, even though we are a marketplace model, all customer service is handled uh, through Mavi. Uh, we want to make sure that it's a cohesive experience for the consumer, right? So ultimately, if there is an issue, they're still dealing with Mavi. We aren't directing them back to any of our brand partners or vendors. Um, with that being said, you know, we do have that 30 day return policy. Um, there's some items that can't be returned and we try to make sure that we're communicating that as much as possible across the site. So they're very clear that, you know, those items can't come back in and that way we avoid less CX issues there. But in regards to really like what we foresee happening with the supply chain issues and all that, um, I would say ultimately what we're trying to prepare for with our CX team now is just scaling it, making sure that we have the support that we need um, and even working on the back end to make sure that, you know, through all of the systems we're using to keep and manage all the vendors and all the orders um, that we're able to make sure and get those messages over to the vendors as fast as possible and work through those with them. Um, and then we're also as a team looking at, okay, what possibly may be some scenarios that we want to look into after we launch not only our app, but then the direct to consumer site that will be coming in um, fall as well too. So we're still working through a lot of that because we are a young company. But with that being said, I, it's definitely scaling up our CX team and making sure that we have all the you know right uh, processes in place to just make sure that it all runs well. Yeah, one thing that I picked up on that you said was just making sure you communicate really well, mm -hmm. you know, when things are, you know, you can't return them and, and the communication on the PDP a lot of times can, can help, you know, keep the customer service issues down. Um, 
coming from, I worked for a size and fit technology company. And a lot of times it's just the clear communication that sometimes people forget to do in terms of merchandising can help a lot with the customer service issues. And so it's a big part of just listening to the customer and giving them what they want on your site. It's a merchandising experience. It's a big part of it. Absolutely. And uh, what about you, Steve? What do you think? What, um, what yeah. ish, how are you uh, preparing in that sort of sense? So, so as, as far as uh, customer service, um, uh, one thing we, we would like to do and then look towards our technology partners is, is how can we um, build in features and functionality to help address some of the reasons and causes for, for um, escalations. And then Rachel, you mentioned the fit, right? And so, so one of the, some of the questions that we get is, is you know, size chart related, right? And because they can't touch and feel, they have questions on, 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 on you know, will this fit me, right? And so um, how can we use technology um, uh, and merchandising to, to address some of those questions? Um, uh, and, and so there, there is a, a, a set, or like, how do we eat more easily communicate um, uh, uh, you know, return policies and, and things of that nature? And this is one of those things where uh, having more of an industry standard um, would be nice because this is um, uh, these are things and questions that aren't necessarily um, uh, brand specific, but they're more like how do you shop, right? And and so customers would never should never have to think about well when do I pay and how do I add stuff to my bag and how do I find out what something fits. Some of those things should be consistent from from site to site, and this is where having you know, um, a, a platform that serves up the same types of features and functionality across all of their clients um, would be helpful, right? Um, uh, uh, but, but also for customer service, just as a philosophy is, is uh, um, uh, don't necessarily think of it as wanting to keep customer service calls down to zero. Um, think of customer service as a way of, think about all these calls as a way of, I mean, you now have a chance to talk to your fans and you now have a chance to learn from them. You have a chance to uh, 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 build a relationship with them and, and, and talk to them and, 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 um, uh, 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 and sell to them, right? And get more products into the hands of fans. And so um, you don't necessarily want the call volumes to go down to zero. Um, uh, your customer service agents uh, um, is... is and but by the way, this is not necessarily my philosophy. A lot of this comes from Zappos, um, uh, and and so uh, 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 R.I.P. You know Tony Shea, uh, but um, he has a great book uh, uh, book out there. If you haven't uh, uh, read it, you guys should uh, uh, check it out from from uh, um, uh, on that from from Zappos. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, think of think of customer service as a way of really uh, an opportunity to connect to your fans. Um, and, and, and your agents are, are, in a sense, your best salespeople. So um, uh, train them up to be that um, and, and train them up to, to have a, a good relationship with all your fans to build loyalty. Um, and, and so, you know, for a lot of people who are thinking, um, how, how do I create a, you know, a loyalty program? Well, you already have one. They're your customer service agents, right? So, so treat them, you know, uh, appropriately. And so, um, yeah, so that's my spiel on that <laughs> the amount of things you can learn from a call center or anything any bit of voice of customer that can teach you so much um it's oftentimes I, I feel like overlooked I mean obviously I'm a big proponent of voice of customer um it's a it's a big part of what I do uh, it's it's you know what I talk about every day so um it's a I think it's a thing that all brands can can lean in on is voice of customer it's it's very important well, a huge thank you to our panelists Chelsea and Steve and if you've submitted a question that we get and get to we'll follow up with you via email but just wanted to say thank you to everyone who joined us and thank you again to our panelists we'll see you all soon thank you bye bye